When Stephen King began writing It, his initial inspiration was something out of a Norwegian fairy tale, but as the story progressed, it evolved into a social commentary of sorts. While the cartoonish horrors of Pennywise the Dancing Clown have become iconic and what the story is best recognized and renowned for, it's the layers of deep-seated cultural stigmas, generational trauma, and intersectionality that make it a great deal more than just another scary story. Hi there, I'm your host, Mr. Doyle, and this is a great undertaking. Thanks to everyone who has subscribed to the channel. I recently hit the 400 subscriber milestone and then went back to 399 again and then back to 400 again. So thanks to my new subs and a warm, friendly fuck you to the person who unsubscribed immediately after I shared a video celebrating 400 subscribers. Honestly, though, it was pretty funny and I had a good laugh about it, but if you're interested in Stephen King and supporting a smaller creator like me, please consider subscribing to the channel and then unsubscribing at just the right moment in order to undermine my next milestone. This is the first video of a three-part series for Stephen King's It. In this video, I will be discussing the novel, which was published in 1986, and in the following weeks, I'll be taking a look at the two-part TV miniseries that debuted in 1990, and parts one and two of the feature-length film adaptation, which were released in 2017 and 2019, respectively. Before we get too in-depth about the story itself, I'm going to provide a short summary for anyone who hasn't read the book or perhaps needs a refresher, and then take a look at what initially inspired King to write the story before we jump into the more unsettling subject matter. It. A Brief Summary. A promise made 27 years ago calls seven adults to reunite in Derry, Maine, where, as children, they battled an evil creature that preyed on the city's most vulnerable. Unsure that their Losers Club had vanquished the creature all those years ago, the Seven had vowed to return to Derry if it should ever reappear. Now children are being murdered again in their repressed memories of that summer return as they prepare to do battle with the monster lurking in Derry's sewers once more. History and Inspiration For this section, rather than reinterpret or theorize about what initially informed and inspired King to write it, I'm going to read a passage directly from King himself that can be found on his website. I was planning to trim it down a bit as the explanation is a little long-winded, but it felt like I was editing out parts of what is a story within itself, and that just didn't feel right. So here is the entirety of King's explanation for what would become it. In 1978, my family was living in Boulder, Colorado. One day on our way back from lunch at a pizza emporium, our brand new AMC Matador dropped its transmission. Literally. The damn thing fell out on Pearl Street. True embarrassment is standing in the middle of a busy downtown street, grinning idiotically while people examine your marooned car and the large greasy black thing just lying under it. Two days later, the dealership called at about five in the afternoon. Everything was Jake. I could pick up the car any time. The dealership was three miles away. I thought about calling a cab, but decided that the walk would be good for me. The AMC dealership was in an industrial park set off by itself on a patch of otherwise deserted land a mile from the strip of fast food joints and gas stations that marked the eastern edge of Boulder. A narrow, unlit road led to this outpost. By the time I got to the road, it was twilight. In the mountains, the end of the day comes in a hurry. And I was aware of how alone I was. About a quarter of a mile along this road was a wooden bridge humped and oddly quaint spanning a stream. 
I walked across it. I was wearing cowboy boots with run-down heels, and I was very aware of the sound they made on the boards. They sounded like a hollow clock. I thought of the fairy tale called The Three Billy Goats Gruff and wondered what I would do if a troll called out from beneath me, Who's trip-trapping upon my bridge? All of a sudden, I wanted to write a novel about a real troll under a real bridge. I stopped thinking of a line by Marianne Moore, something about real toads in imaginary gardens, only it came out real trolls in imaginary gardens. A good idea is like a yo-yo. It may go to the end of its string, but it doesn't die there. It only sleeps. Eventually, it rolls back up into your palm. I forgot about the bridge and the troll and the business of picking up my car and signing the papers, but it came back to me off and on over the next two years. I decided that the bridge could be some sort of symbol, a point of passing. I started thinking of Bangor, where I had lived with its strange canal bisecting the city, and decided that the bridge could be the city if there was something under it. What's under a city? Tunnels. Sewers. Ah, what a good place for a troll. Trolls should live in sewers. A year passed, the yo-yo stayed down at the end of its string, sleeping, and then it came back up. I started to remember Stratford, Connecticut, where I lived for a time as a kid. In Stratford, there was a library where the adult section and the children's section were connected by a short corridor. I decided that the corridor was also a bridge, one across which every goat of a child must risk trip-trapping to become an adult. About six months later, I thought of how such a story might be cast, how it might be possible to create a ricochet effect, interweaving the stories of children and the adults they become. Sometime in the summer of 1981, I realized that I had to write about the troll under the bridge or leave him, it, forever. So that's where it started naturally enough, but Stephen King's take on an old fairy tale and the message within the story he tells in it goes way beyond that of a bloodied up version of the three billy goats gruff. Sure, Pennywise the Clown and his various representative manifestations are upsetting and scary, but it's the town of Derry's history and the effects that it has on subsequent generations that brings a deeper meaning to this now iconic horror story. Generational Trauma Full disclosure, this segment is my own interpretation of it, and as a result, my political and social biases will be on full display. I've said this in other videos, but I'm what some would consider a radical leftist, so if my take on the story doesn't sit right with you, or you think I'm inaccurately interpreting the story, I'd be happy to discuss, discuss any disagreements we may have in the comments. Like all art, the deeper meaning found within it is entirely subjective, and I'm willing to admit that my personal perception of the story is likely colored by my preconceived notions, which have been formed by my environment and distinct life experiences. All right, that's, that's enough disclaimers and preemptive apologies. Here we go. There is a recurring theme throughout a number of King stories in which a place or an object absorbs, retains, and consequently emanates the karmic energy generated by the respective story's inhabitants and their actions. In The Shining, King gives us the Overlook Hotel. In Salem's Lot, it's the Marston House. In Christine, it's a 1958 Plymouth Fury. King refers to these places as psychic sounding boards and monuments to evil, and in it, it is the entire town of Derry that is cursed by its own history, and much like the aforementioned stories, it's the unsuspecting and the innocent that suffer the consequences of the actions of those who have come before them, which have corrupted and contaminated these places. 
The effects of generations past still echo and reverberate long after the predecessors have passed on. Their impacts and footprints may fade over time, but they're never truly gone. There's an ever-present, if at times dormant, dark underbelly in which the atrocities and injustices of previous eras reside, occasionally forcing their way to the surface to reassert themselves. To remind the Losers Club in this case, which is of course the ragtag group of protagonists in the story, that the past abuses, atrocities, and discriminatory mindsets of those who came before them have always been there and are still there. Even if their parents and the elder residents of Derry want to pretend that the past is nothing more than a memory with no lasting repercussions. The generation before them wants to forget, they want to ignore the horrific acts going on all around them, and in the case of the Losers Club when removed from Derry, in their adulthood they forget what has happened there as well. They come to believe that all is right with the world simply because the tragedies of their youth are no longer beating down their front doors. When removed from view, the issues in Derry no longer exist in their minds, but when they are reminded of the promise they made to return to Derry should the evil they sought to vanquish in their youth rear its ugly head. They vow to do all in their power to put an end to the cyclical, systemic wickedness that has traumatized them, their forebears, and now seeks to harm their successors. Derry is, like many communities, a place where homophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, ableism, misogyny, slut-shaming, and bullying are an ever-present facet of life, and King goes out of his way to provide us with the details of the small main town's history, to provide a fuller understanding of the all-too-human evils that have resided there and the shameful, cruel things that have gone on in Derry. But these shameful societal norms have a tendency to go into hiding, the negative stigma of being a part of a hate group or a homophobe becomes strong enough to discourage those who would espouse such ideologies and animosity from doing so publicly. They're not always staring us in the face or shouting their rhetoric from the rooftops. Like the adults in Derry, it's not uncommon for people to ignore these problems, to not see them, or to pretend they don't exist when they themselves either aren't personally affected by or directly confronted with them. It's akin to believing that racism ended with the civil rights movement because you yourself have never experienced it directly, or that homophobia ended when queer folk were mostly allowed to get married, as if that allowance made those who would espouse homophobic beliefs no longer exist. Believes? King goes out of his way to put racism, homophobic behaviors, sexist, patriarchal norms, and even fat shaming on full display in this story, and the Losers Club make up a cross-section of nearly every persecuted characteristic and every marginalized minority that has historically been discriminated discriminated against to some degree or another. Bill has a debilitating speech impediment, Mike is black, Stanley is Jewish, Beverly is a young woman with an unstable home life and an unwarranted rep, 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 reputation. Eddie has a mentally abusive mother, Ben is overweight, and Richie is... Well, he's mostly just a fucking nerd, I guess, but his character sure seems to be neuroatypical or perhaps has ADHD. And it is theorized, however, I don't believe it is confirmed in the novel, that Richie may also be gay. But to some extent, they are all victims of societal stigmas, stereotyping, and the systemic consequences of the unsavory ways of thinking which were established long before their time. They're all outcasts. They're all losers. And in their adulthood, long after they have suffered and have seemingly overcome these obstacles, they are faced with the harsh reality that after they have grown up and moved on, those same traumas and unjust treatment have now been passed on to the generation that followed. They never stopped it. They never managed to defeat the troll lurking beneath the bridge. They just managed to scare it into hiding for a couple decades. All the while, it is regaining strength, building itself back up quietly, waiting 
waiting for its time to come round once more, for its chance to reemerge from the darkness and to remind them that it was there all along. And holy shit, are there a number of real life parallels one could draw from this story with events that have previously and are currently occurring in American society with regularity over the course of decades. Social obstacles that many, myself included in some cases, believed we were on the other side of have been returning with renewed vigor and vitriol. The dark underbelly of America is undergoing a sort of reverse peristalsis, causing all matter of indigestible dreck to come vomiting forth from its frothing, fang-lined chasm of a mouth. Belief systems that were once deemed acceptable or at the very least tolerable have often been forced out of the public eye and instead have been relegated to the shadows of society, only to return to the surface to have a spotlight shown upon them yet again. But they were always there. They were in hiding, building their strength, preparing to set upon the next generation with the full force of a well-rested, reacclimated creature looking to terrorize and traumatize to subjugate and indoctrinate, much in the same way that Henry Bowers and Patrick Hochstetter, the secondary antagonists of the novel, are vehicles for Pennywise or it to do its bidding. This re-emerging sinister force in the United States is recruiting and weaponizing those whose upbringing, environment, and life experiences have made them vulnerable and amenable to what can best be described as the nefarious intentions and destructive tendencies which are so intrinsically sewn into the fabric of the centuries-old American tapestry. This force, this gathering culmination of hateful ideologies and rampant bigotry come in different forms and present themselves in all manner of ways, but they are all a part of the same unsettling, malleable monster that is no longer afraid to come up out of the sewer. And so, like the Losers Club, it is up to the elder generations to put a stop to this re-emergence of dark forces that seek to harm and traumatize those who are growing up in the remnants of the world that has been left to them. We have to acknowledge and confront the demons that are now knocking on the front doors of our successors and do something to stop the monsters from coming up out of the sewers of society yet again. And we need to do more than just scare it back into hiding this time. We need to finish the fucking job. Final thoughts. It is a harrowing story that covers a lot of ground, and while the monstrous horrors of the shape-shifting outer space clown are awesome, I tend to find that when King holds a mirror up to the world, the reflection reveals a great deal of shadows that might have escaped us at first glance. If you haven't read this book, I highly recommend it. However, it is a long read that is not for the faint of heart or the easily offended. I realize the bulk of this video has perhaps been more politically charged than the typical video that someone looking for horror content might be interested in, but I never know quite what direction things will take when I start writing a script, and I have a tendency to fixate on one topic that takes up a great deal more time than I had anticipated. And as a result of my lengthy tirade, I never quite managed to get to that scene. If you've read the book, you likely know what scene I'm referring to, but I'm going to discuss that scene and also King's unique ability to fuck up a story with awful sex stuff regularly in a separate video next week because, frankly, I've got a lot more to say about that particular topic than I could reasonably cover in this already incoherent video. Sorry. New videos drop every Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, so click the subscriber bell to get notifications. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoy your 4th of July weekend. Okay, goodbye. Be sure to click like and subscribe to the channel for my continued analysis of all things Stephen King pretty pleased with blood and guts on top. My name is Mr. Doyle, and this has been a great undertaking.